What's going on YouTube? Welcome to another oil painting video. Today we are going to do a plein air painting. That means a landscape painting or actually plein air just means painting outside. So we're going to be painting outside and of course as always this is footage from before. Now if anyone's wondering about the large painting of the horses, I'm still doing little detail stuff to it but I will post the finished painting on my Instagram and maybe make a little another little short video on it but three videos on the same painting might have been too much so I'm up over here with my dog uh, Hugo hopefully he sits on his chair but anyway so we have a 20 by 20 inch cotton canvas that I stretched pretty much like five minutes before painting I like cotton canvas because it is cheaper um, it is easier to stretch and it's better for those kind of like short-term paintings and it can also be versatile for a long-term painting but uh, the thing to know is that cotton doesn't have the lifespan as a, a linen canvas so linen depending on how you prepare them if you prepare them equally linen may last you a lot longer uh, hey Jonas welcome welcome and yes, me and Hugo, we just came back from a run. Um, he is a lot bigger, still nippy, but not not terribly bad. Um, still in the process of teaching him things about life. Now for the painting, uh, like I said, it's a 20 by 20. I'm still using the water mixable oil paints. It is a mixture 50-50 Gamsol and Spike Lavender. The colors on the palette are the same as the ones that are in the description box of the video. And as always, you can um, click on the links. They have Amazon links associated to each color. And if you do decide to purchase anything from the link, not necessarily the paints, but you could buy the paints too, uh, I will get a small commission for it. Paula. Uh, so what are we doing for the landscape right now is killing off as much of the white as possible so uh, these are the pink cherry blossoms some people say that those aren't actually cherry blossoms uh, that the real cherry blossoms are the ones that are smaller and white i don't know i tried to look it up and um they're just they're flowers on a tree to me and luckily this is right behind the uh, apartment where i currently live so i only had to step out about eight to ten feet from my door and I got to set up a plein air painting so pretty uh, nice thing to be able to do there um, so the composition is going to be a uh, branch so a group of cherry blossoms coming from the, this direction here so I'm thinking of this abstract pattern um, that is kind of coming from the top right going down to the bottom left so the abstract is the most important thing in the composition. Um, so uh, a little out of breath, sorry about that. Hey, Paula and Jonas, anyone else here? Uh, let's see, let's ask a question. Where is everyone? I am in Alexandria, Virginia. Colors, you're probably wondering what the colors are that I'm using. What just happened there? Let's go to the video. Why did that play backwards? <laughs> I had the same video clip in there twice. So let's go back, there we are. I must have put the same video twice in my editor. Like I said, I've been kind of all over this morning, all over the place. So there I'm pointing the composition out. Uh, so the colors, what I am using is uh, what happened there? I lost a clip. So something went a little weird with my editing, so I apologize about that. Um, so let's pause it right here. So the colors in the background are ultramarine blue and uh, yellow. It is called primary yellow, I believe, the Cobra Talons. Like I said, these are water mixable. Pretty much just that, uh, ultramarine blue and yellow. And the spots that are darker have more blue. And I do use a little bit of burnt sienna to kill off too much of that intense blue. So it's not too, uh, too strong. Now I need to see what's going on with my footage because I thought that I had everything under control, but maybe I don't. Let's see. 
Yeah, it's just those two clips, I think, that ended up being that way. So the rest of it should be okay. Should be all right. Thanks for watching from Minnesota. Welcome, welcome. Canvas Dancer, welcome Jonas. Thanks for watching from Sweden. We've got a total of 18 people. Where is everyone? Paula is in Kentucky. And I got lucky when I painted these. They were, they are all on the ground now. Um, almost all of them. I mean, they're like little tiny shriveled up flowers. Um, it's kind of crazy, the uh, the timing of it, because the tree was there for like probably two to three weeks, maybe, maybe, maybe almost even four weeks. And I, I'm like, I'm going to paint them, I'm going to paint them, I'm going to paint them. And for some reason, um, I decided to paint them this time. And then they were gone. Like, uh, this has been less than a week ago. So it's Friday, today is Tuesday, less than a week ago. So I got lucky. Now I'm going around the uh, group of flowers with uh, with more of that dark blue killed off with burnt sienna because I intend to go over it with light. So dark blue around it, and this is gonna be wet on wet. So the dark is going to be layered with uh, light, the light green over top of it. Hey Bruno, thanks for watching from Germany. Greetings, daughter, um, daughter of YHUH. Greetings, greetings. Let's see, the brush. Uh, Paula, the brush that I'm using is a bristle brush. I actually did forget to put that in the, in the uh, description. It is a, um, a size 10 Egbert bristle brush. So I'll just write it down for you. 10 Egbert. Uh, Bristle by Robert Simmons. Robert Simmons. There we go. Size 4 Bristle from Robert Simmons. And I, I've actually been keeping the... I don't recommend you do this, but I've been keeping the brushes in, um, in linseed oil. A cup of linseed oil. Uh, just so I can paint uh, daily as much as possible. Um, that's why it looks curved. The, the brushes are a little bit curved, um, but it doesn't bother me. Now here's the next step in the process. I'm putting dark red into those pink flowers. And by the way, those pink flowers, again, very simple, nothing too complicated here. It's red and white, it gives you pink. And I mixed it with a palette knife first, and I applied that with the palette knife. Um, and now I'm going in with, um, with pretty much almost just white. Of course, white with a little bit of something in it. If I put yellow, it goes orange. If I put uh, blue, it blues out. If I put anything close to the greenish, it will brown out, which is not something that I want. So I have my brushes separated. The dark pink color that you see there is a alizarin. Well, it's actually called Matter Lake, but it's like an alizarin. It is, um, it's a little bit less violet than a lizard crimson. Uh, so I put in ultramarine blue to make it a little bit darker. Um, again, those colors are in the description box of the video. I will return to portraiture. Now, usually I ask uh, everyone what they want need to paint next time and next time this time i was supposed to finish up the horses but that painting is so involved <laughs> i didn't realize that that painting would be so involved um so maybe there'll be a short video on it um short pre-recorded for the um what the finish is going to look like but it'll definitely be on my instagram so i have been painting human portraits i just haven't filmed them very much uh, but i will get to doing that uh, pretty soon I will uh, return to the human portraits. And someone, I think someone commented uh, right at the end when I left last week about the Rembrandts. And that's certainly a possibility. We can return to uh, some Rembrandts 
that's one of my favorite things to do. So if you're new to the channel, if you're, if you're new to this YouTube channel f from this month or so, um, I usually don't do anything other than uh, portraiture. But I've since kind of ventured into uh, painting animals and now painting in landscape. Um, and I think it's good to have a, uh, a variety of different subject matters. So you're not just painting the same thing over and over and over and over again, if you know what I mean. Um, so we put in a dark green, which is uh, sap green, ultramarine blue, and a little bit of yellow ochre to prevent it from being too dark for the green of the leaves. And then we put in, now we're putting in some lighter colors, um, which is the primary yellow and uh, I believe yellow ochre, just the two of those. But it wasn't enough. So what I will do later on is I will mix more of the yellow than the green on my palette knife. And I'm gonna go with palette knife onto the um, the flower, the, the leaf of the flower petal. Next thing I'm gonna ask everyone is, uh, when was the last time, let's see if I can type with one hand. Time you plan air painted. When was the last time you plan air painted? And I'm typing with one hand because I'm holding puppy on the other hand. And uh, my answer for you is <laughs> years. I don't even, no, that's not true. I did a outdoor still life for my students about like a week before I got, I got Hugo. So that was probably, we've had him for like a month now, I think. So five weeks ago was the last time I painted outdoors. Five weeks ago, but prior to that, it had to have been years. Um, had to have been years. I can't even... Yeah, it must have been years because I think probably pandemic time, 2020. I think that's when I last did plein air. Hey, Beanpot. So now we threw in the, the leaves. I'm not going in with the background. And this is going to be kind of an evolving composition, but the main idea of that composition of the leaves coming from this direction down here was already in the back of my mind. And I had been looking at that branch for, for days. I mean, I was looking at that branch and I'm like, that looks like a pretty cool bunch of flowers. And I took a picture of it and then I was like, I can do more than take a picture of it. So I, I did think about it. So Jonas, you're, I have never painted outdoors, but it is a thing I want to uh, try one day. Polly wrote in, in college, so 40 years ago. So yeah, you definitely beat me in, in that with the, uh, the last time you plein air painted. So Beanpot, let's see, does the easel out to the patio? Uh, yeah, that counts. Plein air, I think it just means outside. So I could be out in the patio there and that's plein air. That's basically what I did. I was um, about 10 feet in front of um, where, where, I usually, um, where I'm usually painting. It looks like I almost dropped something there. So there you see, I put that almost lined up perfectly with the canvas. It's funny when that happens. Uh, the uh, division there uh, for the floor plane because I didn't even know I would put that. So uh, this floor plane right here, if you look at my red dot, um, that's kind of funny. It matches up perfectly with that. Interesting. And that bush matches up with that. I did Honestly, I didn't plan that out. I didn't think the camera would work. 
Uh, I mean, I knew it would work, but yeah. Um, so actually, here's something interesting. This flower right here is this one. This bunch of flowers over here is this. And this flower here is this one. So um, my eyes are over here looking at that direction, but I implemented this and put it on this part of the composition. Rather dead in the center, I put it it on, I, I put it, it uh, I put it on the bottom. Um, and yes, doggy tires me out, um, but there's gonna be lots of videos on this very unique dog. And you'll know what I mean in the future. Very unique dog. Um, I've never seen a dog like this before. Um, and I'm not talking about appearances either. So uh, let's see. Canvas Dancer. Whoa, that freaked me out too. <laughs> what the heck was that? Something just. Yo, this place is haunted. <laughs> this place looks haunted. Ooh, even the doggy freaked out. Yeah, artistic license for sure, Paula. Um, and you can do that with planner. And there I'm putting the tree. I didn't realize how fast I was painting that. Um, but now we're putting in the tree tree trunk. Um, so in perspective, it is way further back than those leaves. As you can um, as you can see, the tree is a lot further back from me. You can kind of see it there. Yeah, put it putted. <laughs> That's funny. Out of breath for sure. Oh good, Paul. I'm glad that you like the cherry blossoms taking shape. So, good question from Sharpa. When doing landscape, should you start from cool color or warm color? Now I can tell you, as I start to put in the palette knife for the smaller, more smaller to the canvas because they're more distant. Uh, Cherry blossoms. Classically, landscape painters start on a warm tone. Classically, they start on a warm tone and then they add the cooler tones because the theory is most landscape is uh, cooler colors because they're thinking, they're thinking daylight. They're thinking, um, they're thinking. Uh, leaves and all that stuff, grass. Um, so warm, then cool is usually the way it is with most landscape. However, um, that's just the, the tone. But the way that I'm painting this has a lot more to do with the value. So the dark of the, of the uh, leaf, for example, if we go to the dot, uh, look at the dot, the dark of the leaf, I started more with the dark blue because I was gonna go with yellow. So in that case, it started cool, then warm. So you wanna think about how you're gonna layer as well. So I went dark blue and then the warm yellow. It wouldn't have worked if I started with a dark brown and then tried to put yellow there. It would have looked more like a fall. Uh, a leaf uh, from from the fall. So hopefully that answers your question in, in both ways. Um, great question, Sherpa. What time would be best for landscape, morning or evening? Let me tell you. Neither. <laughs> Overcast is one of the best times for landscape. Overcast. Uh, so it was overcast. So it was really cloudy this day. And it was just perfect. It was just perfect. However, if you're going to choose landscape for the morning or the evening, morning is going to be more consistent than evening. Typically, I'm no meteorologist, but um, it's typically going to be uh, cooler, warmer, whatever the temperature is. Typically, we think of warmer with the morning, but but as the sun does its thing, as uh, we do our thing, rotating and moving around the sun, uh, morning light is said to be more consistent. What's going on, hard shot? 
Yeah, hard drive is in my backyard. I, don't, I mean, not my backyard, but the backyard behind my apartment. Like I said, you're welcome to come paint anytime you want to paint. We can do some plein air. Anyone that's in Northern Virginia area, if you want to paint with me, I haven't been able to paint with people in so long. But you have to be okay with dogs, with puppies, because um, this dog is kind of with me all day, every day. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's from Jonas. I'm glad you liked the quick start. Do you use the solvent? Uh, use a solvent to cover the background so quick? Yes. Yeah, I thinned out the paint a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot. Um, so I thinned it out and then I used that bigger brush to cover it. Um, but uh, yeah, I had to cover that background like so much with the thinner. So you used to have a cherry blossom tree, then you cut it down. They're pretty messy. They look nice, like when they appear out of nowhere. This is my first time having a cherry blossom tree that close to where I live. Um, it was where I lived in Maryland. I would have, I had to drive out towards DC to see these. But sometimes places like restaurants and such would have them near. I didn't know how messy they were. Oh, who isn't with the dog? All right, I'm lucky. I I'm lucky. I get to work from home, so I'm with them all the time. No, I've never been back to Zoll. Um, ever since I moved, it's just an hour, forty five minutes, I think, in traffic. Um, sometimes more. Uh, but I will, I will. These trees are expensive, really. Oh, lucky me, they're just back there i also don't like that they're all over the floor though because i read that they're poisonous for dogs and my dog hugo loves to eat anything off the ground so i actually can't walk him in my backyard or the back yard behind me um, i take him around which is actually better for him because he's learning how to walk on the leash better Oh yeah, uh, Jonas, thinning the paint is important. Knowing how to thin it, uh, how much thinner to use. Thinner uh, relative to um, the uh, thicker paint. So I did this a little bit reverse. Of, like Bob Ross says, thin paint sticks onto thick paint. However, I use thin paint and then I put thick paint on it with palette knife. So uh, Sherpa, a good size for a uh, beginner artist to do landscapes would be um, smaller, like eight by 10 inches, I'd say. Eight by 10 inches would be good, nine by 12 inches. Uh, I definitely started smaller when I uh, did my first landscapes a long time ago. Then depending on your personal preference, your personal preference, experiment you try bigger canvases and and maybe you're like me and i i like the physicality of moving that brush around standing back every couple seconds um it, it makes it somewhat like life drawing like life uh painting from life uh, people from life and you see i keep myself at an arm's length away now i'm i'm definitely no expert with um with plein air i choose the impressionist style of uh plein air painting uh and i'll tell you what that means and um plein air uh impressionism impressionism does not mean loose uh it it's sometimes a misnomer that impressionistic means well oh it's very loose and expressive like there's no such thing as an impressionistic drawing uh, people will say, I like to make my drawings look very impressionistic. And it's not your fault for saying that. I mean, it's not your fault for thinking that. It's just sometimes it's not understood what impressionism is. And impressionism has to do with light. It has to do with um, capturing the light. Basically, close your eyes for like, I don't know, 20 seconds. Then open your eyes for... A brief moment close your eyes again when you're outside keep your eyes closed 
open, close. That's something I heard that Monet would do or tell people to do and try to capture the essence of what you see because what you see are a series of shapes of color. Your brain doesn't automatically take in flower petal, dog in the distance, uh, spoiler alert, um, trees, branch. Uh, your, your brain doesn't take in all those details right away. Your, your brain takes in the uh, visual experience of shapes of, of color. Technique-wise, the Impressionists did work on white. They didn't work on toned canvases, which was incredible for that time period. However, other people like the Pre-Raphaelites, I heard uh, some of the Pre-Raphaelites worked on white and they came before the Impressionists. So, um, but one of the big things about the Impressionist type of painting is they worked on white. The idea of working on white is that you uh, see the purity of the color without the interaction of a color on the canvas. So it is a color-based approach as opposed to a value-based approach. So from Paula, let's see, would you mind if I tried this with cold wax in the future? You can, yeah, sure, you can try it with, uh, you can do it with the cold wax medium. Um, now typically, now first of all, I encourage all kinds of experimentation with uh, painting. Representational painting with experimentation is probably one of the most uh, iconic things during this time period in art history. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation going on with uh, classical painting. And that's because there's such a variety of ways now for artists to get educated. There's probably today a bunch of 20 something year old painters that were educated purely on YouTube that now have galleries and things like that. And none of them probably paint how painting was taught back in a hundred years ago or something like that. Like I have training that goes back towards um, Nelson Shanks times, that goes back towards William Mary Chase, that goes back towards uh, towards Sargent's time. However, I don't say I paint like them. I just have that training in my background. And what I'm getting at is now is the time in art history where experimentation with mixed with classical realism is a very big movement, a very big thing. Um, so, sorry about going off on a tangent there. Um, so let's see, from Parting Mist, uh, let's see, glad you brought up the, oh, look at me, did you see that? <laughs> did you see me do that? That's one of the things about, I'm so distracted today, that's one of the things about plein air, I hate the bugs, especially bees and stuff that fly around me. And I know that they're important for the environment. So you could see it. You could see it flying around in there. So look at me. I'm freaking out. Um, but, but yeah, let's see. Parting Miss, you wrote, uh, glad I brought up the Impressionism thing. Uh, let's see. You take Impressionism to mean the impression made upon the eye. Well, good, good. So uh, Mary, Marie Marie wrote, uh, and I appreciate the question, by the way. Did you take a while to learn the right consistency of oil paint? I am having a hard time learning the fat over lean since I've been working with acrylics. It does take a while, yes. Um, but if you follow a traditional approach to painting uh, that encompasses fat over lean, like a traditional painting project or something to work on, uh, it, it helps you with fat over lean. When you're doing a la prima, it's the wild west. You can pretty much use any consistency you want because it's a la prima. Uh, fat over lean means the consistency of the oil to pigment ratio throughout layers. A la prima is just one layer. 
However, with Aloe Prima, you still want to be careful uh, and don't use something that's uh, very uh, like exotic that you don't know. Like, and I'm talking about brands, not mediums, but brands. Just try to keep it as pure pigment and, and oil as possible. So parting miss, you don't, uh, much like impressionism being reduced to bad drawing and broken color. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Painting mist, you wrote, I never thought of it as color instead of value. Oh, yeah, um, definitely it was about the uh, color of the light. And uh, Monet would always say the fleeting light, the fleeting light. Um, and uh, if you look up Henry Henchy, Henry Henchy, I'll type his name out. He was the teacher of John Ebersberger, who taught me directly, um, though I didn't study with him that much. Uh, I did study with him at some point. Um, but this guy, Henry Henchy, he was the teacher of one of my teachers, and he was the teacher of Nelson Shanks, who was the teacher of my other teachers. So uh, my grand teacher uh, is Henry Henchy. Let's just put it at that. Um, and uh, it's all about every plane change is a color change. It's all color, not value. However, uh, in, in reality, you do want to always consider value. Um, always have value as part of the conversation. So party miss you with the separate color things, making think about divisionism. I'm not quite sure what that means. And then you wrote, I think we have a habit of putting the importance of value too much higher than the uh, hue and saturation. I think it is more important, but only slightly got to give hue and chroma their due. So um, good question there. So um, the, the theory that it's um, you get the right color, you get the right value only works scientifically uh, because, well, because uh, a color by definition has three components, hue, value, and chroma. So since value is a subset of a color, therefore, if you get the right color, you get the right hue because the hue is a subset of the color. That's what works scientifically with this, uh, this method of thinking. Now, I will, sh I will tell you exactly where my painting deviates and goes wrong from um, from that idea and here's where my painting doesn't quite work with that idea and that is because I use the same color for the cherry blossoms all throughout and I used the same color for the leaves the light green of the leaves like I said I went in with palette knife with more yellow than blue now would most painters do that Yes, I think most painters would do that. Now, here's where it differs. If I had another red, like uh, perylene red, or if I had quinacridone magenta, or if I had cadmium scarlet, if I had a much broader range palette, I would have focused on the differences between each individual cherry blossom, um, but I didn't quite have the time. So instead I focused on a unification of the uh, color of the cherry blossoms relative to the color of the background. Thinking of the cherry blossoms, and I know I'm talking a lot today because there's a lot to talk about with landscape because um, I usually don't talk about it. Um, I'm thinking of the cherry blossoms as one plane, like a brick, one plane I don't know what happened there. Oh, I'm focusing the camera. As one plane, the shadow side as another plane. I am grouping them together, and I'm looking at that color in relation to the color of the background. So the relation of the color of the background is more yellow and green relative to the cherry blossoms. Well, that's obvious that the background is going to be more yellow green than the cherry blossom. But to what extent is that color different from the
the surrounding greens. So for example, when you're doing plein air, try to think about this. How does this one patch here of, of green vary from this one? And how does this patch here of green vary from this one? Now they look the same and you can paint them the same, but if you wanna do color painting, you want to bounce your eye back and forth from them and see what is the real difference between them uh, as opposed to just painting it as you see it. Now on my canvas, you will see that there's a lot of editing that goes into play. This whole plane here is still just this minus the little body of water there. So I'm looking at this relationship relative to this one. This one has more yellow. This one has more green. This green here has more yellow in it than, um, whoops, let me get my dot here. This has more yellow in it than this. This has more blue in it than this. So you have to always look at these color relationships. Um, and it looks like I forgot to turn off the autofocus. Uh, but luckily my camera is smart enough to focus on things that are moving um, instead of just focusing on, on my head. So parting misty wrote, um, what extent aspect I think of it as a color proportion, color has proportion just like size does. Yeah. You can think about it that you can use the word proportion as it relates to something in comparison to something else. Yeah, um, that's a pretty unique way to think about the word proportion. But yeah, I I would agree with you. I think so. Because um, all it has to do is a relation of one thing to another thing. So from Jonas, you wrote, to develop as an artist, do you also agree that it's important that you try different things like landscape, plein air, portraits, animals, flowers, and so on, rather than focus on one thing? Yes, I do think that is true. Um, I think it is important to focus. Um, hopefully my camera will focus, but it is important to focus on uh, a, a variety. Of, that's so cool. My camera focuses when it's supposed to. That's neat. Um, that is so neat. Um, I'm easily distracted. So uh, yes, it is good to focus on one thing as your, think about it like in college, you you have a major um, and that's your major, right? But you're not going to go to college. You're not going to go to university and just, I'm majoring in math. So I'm doing math. I'm not taking an English class. I'm not taking a psychology class. I'm not taking a finance class. Well, university is smarter than that. Uh, it will make you take, um, it will make you take, um, uh, I forgot what they're called, like uh, general education courses, that, gen eds. It, it'll make you take, um, uh, yeah, it'll require you like, you're gonna to have to take a computer science class if you wanna be a, a math person. You're gonna to have to take a math class if you wanna be a computer science person. Uh, and you can also have minors as well, and that can cover a lot of things. Now, it's been a long time since university for me, a very long time, um, but the same applies in real life. And uh, it's a constant learning. It's important to always have uh, something new to uh, get that neuroplasticity, not that I'm a I don't know much about, you know, brain anatomy and all that stuff, but I know about neuroplasticity. And I know that the brain is, is flexible and always like moving um, as the axons and dendrites fire up in your brain. So uh, when you introduce a new concept, like learning new languages is great because it gets your brain to like think in different ways. Um, it helps with painting is what I'm saying. Like your skill set with painting is only broadened when you incorporate other subject matter to complement your uh, main your main focus hopefully that made sense uh paula you wrote, is there a little more blue in the background 
or uh, uh, background sky or is that gray? It's pretty gray. Um, it's a blue gray overcast. So this is a blue gray overcast. Up here it looks lighter um, because I can never achieve that value or the value say on my arm on the canvas. But yeah, it's a uh, it's a bluish gray. It's grayed out. Oh, good, Jonas. I'm glad you liked the explanation. Sorry, I forgot the aqua focus there. Now, here's another thing about plein air painting um, that's very important, and you'll you'll often see very new. Uh, painters and I've actually even seen this on YouTube by people doing tutorials um, not to say any names because I really don't remember but um, you never want to have your canvas if this is the plane of my canvas you never want the canvas in direct sunlight in direct daylight you never want the canvas in direct daylight uh, and a cherry blossom petal fell like right above my head. So you never want the plane of your canvas facing the daylight. You always want your canvas angled slightly away from the daylight, which is why I'm so far away from that flower because I needed to rotate the canvas. You will see very experienced plein air painters actually move their, um, their easel relative to um, the daylight, or they're so prepared that they have an umbrella. The next thing you always wanna have, especially in sunlight, is a visor. I always have a visor to help you see the colors more clearly. I didn't need the visor that much that day because it was overcast. However, if I had thought it through a little more, I would have had a, a, a visor. But I'm glad I didn't because where my head is, it would have blocked some of the footage. So from Parting Mist, you wrote, uh, have you ever used Soft Pastel? Uh, do you like it? I often use those. I enjoy the messiness. Um, I haven't used Pastel in a long time. Um, I've done Pastel drawings, but that's just that's one tone. But Pastel Color, no, I haven't used it in a long time. I don't even know if I can now because my puppy is all over the place um, with me. So, uh, I mean, he's currently sleeping on my lap. So uh, I would be a little careful, too careful with getting the pastel. And he's dreaming. His leg is moving. That's cool. Um, you know, I could do pastels outside, though. Plein air pastel. Um, and then I wouldn't have to worry about... Um, harming the doggy, so that might be a good thing. So, part of Mr. wrote, uh, you like to paint. Oh, wait, you wrote another one. Somebody wrote something I missed. So, Bean Pot, you wrote, is it because the uh, of the light or does the sun make the painting dry too quick? Um, it's because of the light, uh, and if there's a bright light on your canvas, you're not going to be able to judge your uh, colors or your values, more importantly, your values very um, efficiently. So you're actually going to end up painting things a lot darker if you are painting with the canvas in direct sunlight. And then once you take it inside, then you're going to be like, what in the world? This looks completely different. Uh, so that's why you want to have it at an angle. So party miss you, I like to paint in my backyard at all time. Uh, let's see, what gets me is how fast the color changes. I mean, the colors are like significantly different every 12 or so minutes. Yes, that to me uh, shows that you have a lot of training in uh, painting with color. Very good, I'm glad that you mentioned that. And uh, that means you have a very high understanding. Uh, I didn't even mention that. And yes, the colors do change drastically as the daylight changes. And the more you paint outdoors, the more you'll be able to notice that. Uh, so good. I mean, excellent. Uh, that definitely shows that you have a lot of uh, knowledge about that. So awesome, awesome.
I'm glad you like pastels too, Paula. Uh, interesting story here for the case, um, the case about the studio dog and um, water mixable oil paints. This guy, in one of his training sessions, backed up into a wet painting and had black paint all over his tail and his backside. Guess what? It was water mixable, so I was able to put him in the shower right away and it came right off. I don't even want to imagine if I had like uh, like an alkid or something like that on his fur. Um, those of you that have your own studio where your dog isn't going to be roaming around or your cat, well, cats are smarter than that. They're not going to just back up into a painting. Um, and dogs are smarter too, but I mean, what do you expect from a puppy, right? Uh, so pretty useful that I had that. And uh, that, I can't believe that's it, really. Well, that went by quickly. This was fun. So... Okay, so in the end, um, I remember my battery actually died. So um, let's go uh, right here. What's the difference between here and here? Here and here. There's really only one difference. See if you can spot it. Who's the first person that spots the difference between this and this? this and this so who can spot the difference i'll give you a hint ears this and this the cat yes there we go the cat which is actually the dog and he's always referred to as are you walking a cat uh, my dog does have ears like that, um, and he wasn't actually there. I made him up, but I, I do remember his ears and his tail curves that way. Um, but yeah, my battery died. So that's one thing about painting outside. Uh, if you're going to be painting outside and recording, bring some extra batteries. But luckily, I didn't miss that much. Hey, Diane. Yeah, the dog. You got the dog. Um, Party Misty you wrote, uh, you have two, two big dogs. A uh, small house, got to be careful. Yep, yeah, definitely. And I don't have any cadmiums or any lead, so if it gets in the paint, it's not the end of the world. Um, although I do know an artist that their dog ate a tube of cadmium scarlet, and there was... It's not funny anymore now that I have a dog, but there was bright fluorescent orange poops all over the backyard. Um... I'm gonna sneeze you. I'm gonna sneeze you. And he woke up right when the footage ended. Uh, he was napping with me for a while. Uh, I made my leg fall asleep, but that's all good. So as always, let's backtrack a little bit and see what we did today. So you can see how thin the paint is because it's dripping. You see that? It's dripping on the bottom left. Cover the dark of the background first. Make sure that your canvas is at an angle with respect to the daylight so that you are in the shade. Wear a visor if you can and make sure you have a very sturdy easel. Always have your uh, canvas 90 degrees or even slightly bent in is not a bad idea. Next, keep yourself at arm's length away. Thin out the paint, cover the daylights out of the background. Um, make sure that you put the right video clip in your YouTube video. And then once you kill off the background, go in and fill the color for the big masses. And always make sure you have your composition in the back of your mind already, or even better, do some thumbnail sketches of your composition before you uh, add in the, uh, the, the, the big shapes. And if your composition evolves like mine did, it's okay, but at least the big picture was already uh, thought out ahead of time. Fill in some darks if you're going to do Alla Prima, and then add the light over top of the darks, like that. Add the lights over top of the darks. Big picture is important. So now we're putting in some extra things in the background. Big picture 
And now small picture. Now we're going to add smaller little details into the flower petals. See that? That was it. That was the smaller picture, adding the smaller details into the flower petal. Then I push the light a little bit more with the um, with the leaves and um, smaller shapes, more refined color relationships. And uh, that's pretty much it. And this painting was done in under an hour. Uh, so the daylight was pretty good and it was overcast. So like I said, um, pretty perfect with the weather. And there you have it. We ended up having painted in Hugo the doggy in there uh, as an addition to uh, to this painting. And luckily the cherry blossoms didn't fall all over the place uh, until a couple days later. So from Parting Mist, uh, you wrote, did you enjoy your session? I'm normally pretty happy that I made the time to get out there. Yeah, it was definitely a lot of fun. Um, I, I didn't quite realize how lucky I was with the timing of it, but yeah, it was a fun, fun painting session. It's not your usual painting that you see from me. Uh, it's, it's more color focused. It's, uh, it's definitely, definitely looser, uh, but it, it was definitely a lot of fun. A oh, good Jonas. I'm glad you like painting the cherry blossoms and the colors. So I typically focus on um, portraiture, but we are doing a still life project in the uh, in the online classes. Uh, so we have a variety of, of different things. We've got figure painting. We've got uh, old master painting. We do have one landscape, actually, I think two. Um, and now we've got a still life project. So we've got a lot. So here is my schedule again. This is my schedule for my uh, my um, my Patreon for my online classes. So Mondays are beginner level lessons, Fridays intermediate. $10 a month gets you access to all of the pre-recorded videos. And Tuesdays uh, is really important because Tuesday I upload a video for my online students giving students feedback on the artwork that they send me throughout the week. So the students are able to send me up to two images each week. Uh, it could be class projects or it could be your own artwork, uh, but I can give you feedback directly um, in the virtual classroom. And then beyond that, in blue, uh, we have uh, the Zoom tiers. Um, so uh, that are, that's a different tier. And then we have a live stream tier. Um, but uh, yes, online classes begin at just $10 a month. And I see that plein air is probably not uh, a um, very sustainable type of video for me to do. Um, I've got more likes than I have viewers, um, which is uh, kind of interesting. But thank you so much for uh, leaving, leaving a like and attending the stream. And uh, for everyone else watching this, wondering if I'm ever going to go back to portraiture, of course I am. Uh, we're going to return to that next time. So this will be the point where I ask if there are any last minute questions. So you wrote, what color of green are those leaves on the blossom? Uh, it's mainly just primary yellow and then a touch of ultramarine blue. Um, but they're quite light. They were pretty bright, lighter than I thought the leaves should be. Okay, I'm glad that you enjoyed the, the stream parting mist. Yep, see you next time, Jonas. Okay.
So there probably won't be too many last minute questions as there are only about 10 of us here now today. So once again, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you so much for watching. From uh, Hugo and I, thank you so much. We wish you the very best in all of your artwork. And we will see you on the next one.